So again, thank you. Uh, this topic, as much as any topic in my career, is one that seems to evolve and change day by day, certainly week by week. And over the last eight months, we've seen incredible uh, understanding, learning, uh, and change with respect to what was the novel coronavirus and now known as COVID-19. So tonight, I'm going to provide an update around that's really important. It's important for our community to understand. I'm sure that we have a number of viewers this evening and uh, that includes not only students, parents, but also staff members. Okay, next slide, Sean. So tomorrow, this will go out via podcast, this portion of, the, um, this portion of tonight's presentation. And what I thought I would do is hit some key points, almost like an executive summary. So one of the challenges of providing comprehensive information to families is it takes a while to do that. So some of my updates are a little bit long. On the other hand, it's critical that we walk through all the specific details and rationale for thinking. So at a high level, uh, weekly e-blast started about a month ago, and on every Friday we're able to share with our community the metrics that we're using for decision making. That also allows us to share on a weekly basis some of the key points of focus. Then during board meetings we have a more comprehensive update. With respect to our educational model, and I signaled this through our weekly update on Friday. We are at a place where we are giving notice of a recommendation to make a transition to 100% virtual for all. And I'm going to talk through that based upon the conditions and cases. So the conditions are worsening. The cases, specifically at Pine Richland, are increasing. And when we talk about cases, there are direct cases which are cases directly involving Pine Richland students or staff, and then indirect impacts of cases. So for example, we might have a parent, a mom or a dad, who is COVID positive at, at, at home, not a part of our district, but they have two or three kids and those children are quarantined during the period of time that the parent might be positive. So we have direct and indirect cases. I'm gonna talk through very specifically what happens with case investigation. When we learn of a confirmed case, what are the next steps of the process? There's confusion and misunderstanding about what that looks like, so we want to be very clear about what are we doing and how do we coordinate with the Allegheny County Health Department. The important part of what we've been talking about since the summer is our hybrid approach with the big three really provides strong mitigation. So when it comes to cases and case investigation, one of the greatest strengths that we have is the design of the hybrid that we have in place, and that makes a big difference. Health Services uh, has done an incredible job, and their job is to coordinate and communicate effectively, and we've talked before about how to balance the level of concern with awareness, also with privacy. We are heading into a very distinct time with respect to college, return of college-age students to the home, and also a couple of different holidays and breaks that bring with them uh, other risks of significant concern. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about uh, treatment and prevention. Next slide. <clears throat> Six weeks ago, given the conditions and the rare few cases that existed, we said in the upper right-hand corner of this slide, that V for the cloud virtual for all option, it got a lot smaller. Here we are six weeks later, and we are at a place where we believe conditions and cases for a number of factors that we're going to talk about support moving to that 100% virtual off contingency plan. That's a really challenging thing to think about, and the speed of change is something that everyone in our society and certainly in public education has to be able to respond to. Uh, again, six weeks ago, we were talking and thinking about, is there a time to return more students to the classroom and reduce some of the mitigation? Those questions were being asked. Six weeks later, conditions and cases have changed significantly. And so that V in the upper right-hand corner 
uh, is really where we are. And I'm going to share tonight that recommendation that we're moving towards that virtual, 100% virtual for all at or near the Thanksgiving break that's coming up next week. And I'll share why. Uh, next slide, please. So it begins with some of the measures. So this, these are the Allegheny County metrics. We share these in the e-blast every Friday. We have been following and sharing these measures for almost 12 weeks now. And the two critical parts, and this comes from the PA COVID-19 early warning dashboard. First is incidence rate per 100,000. This, this talks to the amount of virus, again, that is in the community, as does the PCR positivity percentage. We have seen exponential growth in Allegheny County in terms of the incidence rate. So you can see over these, these recordings, uh, when we got to last Friday, which was the last released measure, we were at 138.7 um, in terms of the incidence rate per 100,000. That moved from what was yellow or moderate into what is reflected here in pink or red to demonstrate substantial spread. In the positivity, we went from below five, which is shown in green, to 7.7%. And again, this is based on PCR tests, which is in the moderate range. So I added a little box there that said, you know, in recent days, the region, state, and country have set daily records for confirmed cases and hospitalizations. So what is being seen on a national level, what is being seen in Pennsylvania as a state, and what is being seen in our region, they mirror each other in terms of these measures. Next slide. So again, about six weeks ago, we put that dark green box in the middle up there. That's what we were talking about. Six weeks later, we added the one at the bottom middle that says new, when might a shift occur to the full virtual contingency model for all students. So what has changed? On the left side of the slide, we see those two key measures, incidence rate and PCR percent positivity. The red star is reflective of that 138.7 change. So now the incidence rate is in a substantial spread. The, the PCR positivity in the yellow star has moved into that uh, middle area. This is the model that was released in August by the Pennsylvania Department of Education and the Pennsylvania Department of Health to provide some thresholds or framework for school districts to consider how they offered their instructional program. And as we look to the right column there, we see in moderate, blended or full remote. And then in the substantial, it's indicating towards the full remote or what we refer to as the uh, virtual for all uh, contingency. Uh, next slide. So those are the conditions. The conditions have changed significantly. And the conditions are, the, the cases are rising exponentially. Even in this, these first four days of the next se seven-day reporting cycle, we see um, unprecedented numbers for our county in terms of the number of cases. So this is a change. What's different than a month ago? Almost everything relative to the amount of virus that's in the community and the number of confirmed cases that are happening. So this is, this is significant. Earlier today, all of the superintendents, uh, executive directors in Beaver County and Allegheny County were on a call with PDE and the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Allegheny County was, Health Department was on the call as well because we are now in the first week of what the state refers to as substantial spread. We're in the first week. We anticipate very clearly that on Friday of this week, when, we get the, new, when the new numbers are released, they will indicate that we'll be in, headed into our second week of substantial spread. And again, that is important because with it comes a recommendation from Pennsylvania Department of Ed and, and Health to move to a full virtual uh, model. When we learn of a case, so before I share specific case information with our students, parents, staff, and community, I want to talk about the process that we use when that happens. 
really important. We hear words like transparency. We, wanna, we want transparency in communicating certain uh, information. This is very clearly and transparently the process that we follow uh, to respond to cases that occur. So first is notification. We become aware of a confirmed case of COVID-19 either by a of a student or of a staff member or of a parent. Most of the time, we learn of that from the family or from the staff member. Only rarely are we notified first because the test result was processed, went to the county, and then came to us via communication. So very often we're receiving that information first, which is extremely helpful because then we can go to step two, which is gather initial facts and we organize our team. Our pandemic response team is well-practiced, cohesive, organized, efficient, effective in gathering that initial information. And then step three, we summarize that timeline and key facts with the Allegheny County Health Department. Allegheny County Health Department, despite the overwhelming number of cases in the, in the infrastructure that naturally exists, has really prioritized schools. We could not ask for more than what they have been providing us. And they couldn't ask for more than the quality of information and details that the Pine Richland School District shares with them. We give them every piece of information to help them best evaluate the nature of things. And then together we work on what is the appropriate next steps. And that may include some um, contact tracing. We, again, with Allegheny County step four, immediate action is determined. So in the case of a, a confirmed positive, that means the person is isolated. Uh, it means that any siblings in that home would be quarantined. And um, in the contact tracing part, if there are other areas to consider, we're able to quickly understand that and work in conjunction with Allegheny County Health Department to, to take all of that appropriate action or communicate. Uh, again, in, incredibly helpful. What matters during that whole process is the Pine Richland hybrid. So this, this is so tough to get through, but if our people, students, staff, et cetera, have been with discipline and fidelity implementing mask wearing, implementing the six feet of physical distancing that's built in, hand sanitizing and building cleaning. If that's happening, then it almost eliminates the chance for transmission within the school environment. So that's huge because that then impacts the number of people who may need to be quarantined given the status of close contact. And then finally, step five is monitoring the timelines for isolation or quarantine and communicating all of those things to relevant people. So I've said before, it's worth saying again, I'm incredibly proud to work with the team and of our school nurses and health department, just really um, the head of the class when it comes to, to professionalism. Next slide. So since the start of the year, we've seen an evolution. So in September, we had two cases of COVID-19 among students and staff combined. So the numbers we're showing here are students and staff. We had two. And think back to what did the conditions look like at that time, incidence rate and positivity. In October, we had five. In the first 16 days of November, we have had 24 students and staff combined. And a lot of that 24 has actually happened within the last 10 days. So the increase, the exponential increase in virus in the community, region, state, et cetera, we are seeing that in the reported cases that are happening within the school. So that's 24 times that we're working through that process on direct cases involving students or staff. In parentheses, it's noted 13 active, 11 resolved. That means that of those 24 cases, 13 of them are still within the 10 days of isolation that happened from symptom onset. 11 have passed through that window, and so the staff member or student is able to return to school or teaching uh, in an in-person setting. 
But again, uh, those are the specific numbers. What we plan to do beginning this Friday's e-blast is we plan to include our cases to date. So these measures will be updated to our community and staff every Friday, just like we do the other conditions. So a couple other key points here. First is important. Of those cases, those two and then five and then 24, they are distributed across our six schools. So there's almost no pattern to them. They are isolated incidents that we see in almost every case. And again, that's important to understand from the standpoint of decision making around what happens with the positive case. The totals for those that do not monitor surrounding area schools uh, are pretty consistent with other schools in our area. So proportionally, you would expect a larger school system like maybe a Seneca Valley to proportionally have a different number than you would a smaller school district like an Avonworth. Uh, but again, we're, we're right in line with uh, what is out there. As I mentioned, because of our model, we have had very little need to quarantine large numbers of students or, or staff. And that's because our people have taken the model seriously and they have followed those uh, precautions and we are able to be very specific uh, in our action. The last comment I'll make, uh, again, is repeating something uh, from Dr. Bogan and Dr. Brink, and that is both at Pine Richland and in Allegheny County, they're seeing little evidence of transmission in schools, and that's based on the highly regulated environment and precautions that we have in place. Next slide. I'm not going to go through this one. Uh, it's here so that it's reflected on the record, but I did talk about it last month to some uh, degree of detail. Uh, but there is a balance in communication when it comes to awareness and then the privacy rights of individuals. So again, every Friday now, our community will receive the conditions, that's incidence rate and positivity, and the number of specific cases uh, to date for our schools. Next slide. The bullet that I wanted to emphasize on this slide is the very bottom one that's in bold. Uh, and that is one of the critical elements that has continued to be reinforced both by the science, the research, the experts that are on our Pine Richland Healthcare Leadership Council is that multi-layer cloth face coverings are the most effective, not just for protecting others, but also for protecting self. In Pennsylvania, face shields are permitted. That, that was part of that process. And there are exceptional cases where a student or a staff member may not be able to, um, to wear a, a cloth face covering. But absent that um, need, and again, that's the exception rather than the rule, we really want to emphasize for all of our families, all of our students, and all of our staff members, the most beneficial action that can be taken is a multi-layer cloth face covering that meets the um, sort of the CDC requirements. So in the PDF version of this, that's a hyperlink that comes, goes to the research on face coverings. Next slide. So I wanna talk about this for a second, and we, we have been talking about this. So when PDE and the PA Department of Health came up with the first set of guidelines, which is on the type of instructional model, they also shared some initial thinking about when should schools close or consider closing for a period of time. We have said now for two months that that framework was antiquated. It was not accurate. It was designed at a time that COVID-19 was not fully understood in schools or to account for the differences in modeling that happens within those schools. So guidelines, not magic numbers. Today on the call uh, with PDE and the Department of Health, it was again stated that they are reviewing this to look at revising this because it's just not relevant. Um, and, and again, decision making around what to do when a case emerges has been made with very specific 
very collaborative discussion with the Allegheny County Health Department, absolutely 100% focused on the health, safety, and well-being of our students and of our staff. Next slide. So again, just a quick summary. Amount of virus increasing, PRSD cases significantly increasing literally over the last 10 days. Um, we've done the contact tracing with fidelity every time. Little evidence of spread in schools. Where the county health department is seeing the biggest challenge are in social gatherings. They can be of small numbers, but they're in, in social gatherings where there's a lack of attention to some of the behavioral things like masks and distancing, et cetera. And that is leading to these little, little mini um, things happening in terms of the rates. And again, at Pine Richland, our cases have been distributed across all schools. Uh, hybrid makes a difference. And to this point, our staff-related cases have been very few. Uh, that's a little different, actually, than the metrics that are being seen in the county wide with respect to schools. It's almost two to one right now, students to staff. It is a much higher ratio here, which means we have much lower numbers uh, with respect to staff. And again, in every case, contact tracing occurs. Next slide. So what's happening that's different is right now, colleges and universities are mostly making decisions, if they haven't already done so, that as we get to Thanksgiving break, they're sending students home and they're asking students to remain at home and finish out their semester online. So what that means, and the challenge at colleges and universities, is that it's a communal living, it's dorm living, it's apartment living, it's, it's a challenging place to enforce the big three with a, a population of kids that are 18 to 21 years old. So all of those uh, students are coming home. When they come home, they could be infected, they could be asymptomatic, but ultimately they're coming back to their family and they're spending time with their family. They're gonna do the things as you would expect anyone to do when they're with their family. But it increases risk relative to transmission just by, by its nature. We have Thanksgiving holiday coming up and a whole lot has been said and written about what, what that means. Um, first, the concerns were travel. Well, every place in the country, for the most part, is a hot spot. Our county, you don't want to, you know, so there is no travel that is necessarily a great place to travel. So the focus has been on what is smart travel. You know, smart travel, if it needs to occur, is travel that involves travel in a personal vehicle, with your family, going to a place with very few people, keeping your distance, all of those other precautions. Uh, but again, I've shared in different meetings, the reality is you can engage in undisciplined practices right here at home, not travel anywhere and get into a lot of, uh, we can get into a lot of challenge in terms of transmission of the disease. So it's, it's really less about where you go and more about how you get there and what you do while you're there that makes a difference. But we're headed into Thanksgiving and what we know about COVID-19 is and the transmission of the disease is, it will take 14 days following that holiday in order to understand, because of the incubation period, what that means. Um, and again, not just for Pine Richland, that's the question facing us in our country, in our state, in the entire region. And given the slope of the line right now with incidence rate, this is of major concern, um, again, across the country. Next slide. So. We've reached a place, and what we would like to do is, again, take the next few days to continue monitoring cases and conditions, but we fully expect that by Friday of this week, we're gonna get an updated report from the COVID-19 early warning dashboard that has us headed into our second week of substantial transmission. And with that will be a recommendation uh, from PDE, PA Department of Health, to go into a full virtual a learning model. But the first bullet is, is something that I really want to emphasize. And I think it's the thing I struggle with the most in the whole topic of how we manage schools and how we manage COVID-19 and how we make decisions. Closing schools or going to a virtual learning model for all 
does not necessarily mean we're going to help the level of virus transmission in the community. Because when children are with us in our schools, they're in a highly regulated, structured environment with distancing and masking and all sorts of other precautions. The Allegheny County health experts say it's not in the schools. It's in the social activities and her behaviors that, that are of risk. However, there are factors that we, we need to consider and factors that are leading us to make this recommendation at this point that we transition. And again, for a time period, we're talking about transitioning to full virtual for all at or around the Thanksgiving break based on what happens here over the next few days. And then we would need to communicate all of that information to students, staff, parents, and the community. So the factors are, first, uh, either Allegheny County recommendations or PDE, PA Department of Health. So I've already shared with the board that the PDE, PA Department of Health, that is coming. We know it's coming. It will be, we expect it on Friday of this week uh, to recommend full virtual. We have seen um, a significant increase in cases. To go from two to five uh, in the first two months to 24 in basically a 10 to 12 day period uh, is a significant change and it's reflective of the increased nature of the virus uh, in the community. The, a critical part, and this is really important to understand, staffing shortages and substitute shortages. And so this staffing is a challenge, not just here, but across schools. So if a teacher cannot be at work, maybe it's because they're in quarantine. They're well and healthy. They might even be teaching virtually, but they cannot come to work in order to do that job. That means we need a substitute, another adult present in that room while that's happening to make that work. We have seen an increase in daily um, absences from in-person attendance as we've also seen the uptick in all of the other um, parts of this. And so again, that leads to challenges in instruction, it leads to challenges in, in supervision. Uh, and there are some other things, again, what makes it different, the last bullet, we have increased risk coming here with Thanksgiving, increased risk related to travel, increased risk relative to the social gatherings that occur, and what the impact of that is going to be. Uh, next slide. Okay, this, this topic is included because it came up as a question actually at our mid-October uh, board meeting, and that was, can we evaluate distancing? So this slide doesn't sort of seem to fit with the direction of the other questions we've been asking, but I wanted to make sure we addressed it and provide the information for our community. So six weeks ago, the question was, can we bring back more students and decrease physical distancing between those students? And at that time, six weeks ago, we said, let's pump the brakes, let's evaluate what's going on, and we'll find out. So we went back to our uh, healthcare leadership experts and available literature. And again, at this point, there is nothing that's suggesting that a reduction in physical distancing from six to three uh, would be good. And in fact, um, just using our example, if we had had that, the amount of quarantining that would be necessary because we don't have the physical distancing uh, would be significant. Next slide. Okay, so um, again, so there's some positive news on the horizon. So one of the challenges right now is the exponential increase in cases is leading to increased use of, of need for hospitalization, which may test the capacity of healthcare. We're hearing about that here from our healthcare experts differently than ever happened in the summer. So there was conversation about that capacity issue in the spring and summer that did not come to fruition. There's a level of concern that exists now in our healthcare environments that is different than that point. On the positive side, what the experts are telling us is their knowledge and ability to treat to provide therapies is improving. 
uh, not only for Pfizer, but there's, uh, there are other examples of some positive uh, outcomes related to vaccines that may be coming. So there is a hopeful tone, but that is, um, from the best of our understanding, that's not going to impact what happens over the next few months. That is something that has the potential to impact over a large, uh, a, a bigger window of time, uh, but is not going to be of immediate uh, impact. Next slide. Okay, and so again, finally, this is something we've been talking about literally uh, since the beginning. And schools are just one part of the ecosystem. What we do and how we do it throughout our communities has an interrelated and interdependent effect on, on everything else that's happening. One of the examples, um, again, that I think it's an example that's worth thinking about. So we get data on the age range of confirmed positive cases. And a lot of times in a public school environment, you'd look immediately to the school age. You know, what's happening in 5 through 18? But what we see is an increase in confirmed cases among parents. Well, parents are close contact of kids, and that's what happens in the home. And again, we're seeing that college age students and the impact that that's going to have. Uh, so again, we encourage at every one of these meetings, sort of as a public health service announcement, one of the ways that we can help our schools and help what's happening is to really uh, invest as a community in the big three. And by doing it, it makes a, makes a huge difference. Um, so again, uh, Steve, for the purpose of the presentation, that'll be, that'll be it. We have included the Healthcare Leadership Council members again on the next slide, uh, but again, wanted to to share that recommendation um, with the board. It's, all, it's always been a part of our health and safety plan. We've been talking about the continuum for months and months, uh, but what has changed are the incidence and the positivity rate. Uh, what has changed are some of the other factors that are coming in with colder weather, with being indoors, with social gatherings, with Thanksgiving break. And as we think about continuity for kids, we do not want to be in that place where we're going in and out and in and out in a loss of, um, of continuity of learning. We believe, based on those conditions, we should be moving towards the 100% virtual for all with more information on specific timelines coming out to our student staff and families in the, by the end of this week for that transition. And from, from our perspective, we would be looking at a timeline that is around um, initial timeline that would go through the month of December. Uh, it is my belief that it will go longer than that. Um, once we get to winter break, we have the same challenge with gatherings, uh, but initially uh, through the month of December so that we are able to plan for and manage the transition, get into the rhythm of continuity of learning in a virtual way, and then throughout that time, continue to monitor the conditions and cases. Thank you.